now for our final session of today's Investor Summit. A panel of leading financiers and investors will discuss the survival and growth of challenges uh, of the SME sector. They'll also look at how pivotal uh, the support by investors and banks is in guiding the transformational journeys of small businesses in 2021 and beyond. Leading this discussion will be Robert Tay, Cluster Director, Modern Services Cluster of Singapore's Infocom Media Development Authority. Joining him on the panel, Anthony Thomas, Chairman of Momo. And Haryanto Sirianoto, the SME Business Head of Danamon Bank. Golden Gate Ventures partner, Michael Lintz, and co-founder and CEO of Validus Capital, Nikolesh Goel. To ask your questions uh, to the panel, just click on the yellow button beneath the session window. Now over to Robert for this final panel discussion of our Investor Summit on the survival and growth challenges of the SME sector. Good morning from Singapore. And as we close out day four and start day five at the Singapore FinTech Festival, I have the pleasure of being joined by Anthony, Michael, Nicholas, and Harianto. It's my great pleasure to have Michael in the room with me today. So rare to have somebody in person. The topic for today is, are investors and banks doing enough for the SME sector? And before we get into that topic, I just wanted to give an opportunity to each of my panelists to do a quick introduction. Michael, you're in the studio. Why don't we start with you? Thank you. Uh, my name is Michael Linz. I'm a partner at Golden Gate Ventures. Um, Golden Gate is an early stage uh, VC based out of Singapore. We invest across Southeast Asia. We have done around 50 investments in the early stage um, tech industry, um, companies ranging in the healthcare, um, logistics, uh, fintech, but also education. In no particular order, I'll pass, pass over to Anthony. Morning, Anthony. Hey. Uh, so I'm with Momo, uh, which is Vietnam's leading e-wallet. Uh, we are a super app uh, with a wide range of use cases for consumer. Uh, mobile payments, uh, which range from uh, top-ups to bill payments uh, to merchant payments. Uh, so we integrated with the vast majority of the country's banks, telcos, utilities, and public services. Uh, Momo is accepted at merchants from large to small. Uh, so we start with the supermarkets, the convenience stores, the gas stations, but we move to retail establishments, including MSMEs, uh, as well as uh, we support both offline and online purchases. Uh, it goes, uh, you know, again, for the entire range. Uh, beyond payments, Momo is building out its financial services business to enable lending, wealth management, and insurance through the platform. So uh, with regard to SMEs, we see ourselves as an enabler uh, by turning on payment acceptance, providing an opportunity to market and sell products or services through our platform, and eventually enjoy a full suite of relevant financial services. Thank you very Thank much. You very much, Anthony. And Anthony, I'm just uh, going to pass it over to Harianto. Uh, I'm Harianto. I'm from Bank Danamon, Indonesia, uh, one of the top banks in Indonesia. As our vision is to enable millions to prosper, we are having focus on the SME and providing them with the financing. And also right now, we are providing them also with the solutions from digital perspective. Thank you. And Nicholas, uh, just to round up the panel. Hey, thanks, Robert, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I represent Validus. We are one of the leading SME financing marketplaces in ASEAN, with presence across Singapore, Indonesia, Vietnam, and just going live in Thailand. Our forte is supply chain financing, where we aggregate capital from accredited investors, could be high net worth individuals, family offices, hedge funds, credit funds, and the likes, and then channel it to SMEs for their unsecured working capital. Earlier, the panel Earlier the before us was talking about investments in the tech sector, and they were talking about valuations 15, 20, 30 times earnings. And I think that's amazing, the amount of growth that's being taking place there. But in the SME space, it's quite different. I mean, we've looked at 2020 as being a very, very challenging year. I think challenging is an understatement as to what many SMEs have gone through, particularly in this region. And as we look to 2021, they're going to continue to face these challenges. And the question is, and what we're going to address with this panel today is, how can we help them? Are we doing enough to support them? What else can we do in terms of recovery and hopefully beyond recovery, potentially even growth? 
So I think the first question over to the panel is really what do the SMEs need? And we looked at support in different forms. We looked at support, whether it was business support uh, in terms of basic technology, whether it was equity support in terms of actually investments or debt support, just getting enough money through the door to keep the business going. So I wanted to pass this on to Anthony to start with you, please. Sure. Uh, so we, you know, just between us panelists, I think we, uh, we have a range of solutions that we provide. And I would say that ours is kind of a foundational layer or something which feeds into the rest. Uh, so we, we start, our, our, our uh, point of takeoff is really payment acceptance because a bank or a lender will typically look for <clears throat> some form of collateral, right, property or assets, uh, documentation, capability, et cetera. Um, and an investor even looks for more right, when, when it's equity. Uh, so we get started in remote, uh, in minutes, uh, remotely, uh, where we are able to enable uh, payment acceptance, because that's the, the beginning. So we start with identity, uh, but it doesn't require a lot of documentation. It's just about really business registration. Uh, we accept payments, and uh, with the data, we help uh, enable further solutions, right? Part of it is also our range of merchant solutions, whether it's uh, vouchers, digital vouchers to help drive traffic. Uh, we help enable a lot of SMEs who sell on Facebook uh, because payments for ads on Facebook itself is a, is a pain point. Uh, so we enable that. Uh, and then SMEs can take advantage of our mini app platform where not a lot of them can really spend a lot in, in showcasing their product so they can use our app, which has millions of consumers uh, coming in every month uh, to access uh, their services. Uh, and that then becomes a lot of rich data uh, for which then feeds into the formal financial system uh, for, for credit and other solutions. Uh, in this particular pandemic, uh, I'll just give one example where we partnered in June this year uh, with a cooperative, uh, and we helped farmers who were uh, selling, and, and, and we helped them even deliver lychees. Uh, so it was supporting Vietnamese farm product. Uh, and in the first eight hours, we, we sold eight tons of lychees, which is something that we never thought we'd be able to sell through our platform. Uh, but I'll pause there, uh, and, and maybe we'll hear from the others. I mean, it's, it's, I mean really, it's interesting to hear about the challenges that businesses face. Uh, you talked about just buying marketing on, on Facebook. I talked to a technology company in Singapore the other day, and this is from a Singapore perspective. Uh, the founders were helping businesses go online, and they were using their credit cards to buy ad time, and eventually they couldn't buy ad time because their credit cards maxed out or were flagged for fraudulent transactions. So even the very basic services at the bottom of the pyramid for, 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 the, for the MSMEs are are sometimes taken for granted, but can really be a challenge. Um, moving further up, we've got Nicholas, who, and, and, and you, you play a slightly different role here because you're, you're now uh, towards more of the digitalized supply chain. And again, this is another area where uh, SMEs really do need help, and that's where you, you sit. Nicholas. Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, like Anthony rightly mentioned, that when it comes to lending traditionally, it was all about taking collateral financial statements, making it a very onerous process for the SMEs. When we went about doing our business, we said, what can we do differently? And the whole idea came about, let's use alternate data to lend money to the SMEs. You know, if we think about the pandemic, the world came to a standstill. Some countries went into lockdown for a couple of months, some went into lockdown for more. And when we came out of it, SMEs wanted to do work. You know, some of them wanted to supply gloves and hand sanitizers to the hospital. Others wanted to, you know, send workers back to the shipyards and the dockyards, and they needed capital. And that's where we tried to straddle the supply chain saying that, look, when an SME wins a contract, can we finance the contract? Because nobody helps them right then. Once that contract starts invoicing, can we get into a digital form where you know they can start invoicing with us to improve their cash flow? And finally, when they need a little bit extra unsecured working capital to grow their business, can we step in there? So the idea is to straddle the entire supply chain, uh, give the option back to the SME, make it a pay-as-you-go model so that we can be a partner to grow. And that's how uh, we try and do things differently from a traditional lender where uh, the process is a lot more onerous, there is a lot of collateral required. And I think that's uh, that's our role in being a growth partner. So Harianto, from a bank perspective, I mean, banks have been lending, you know, 
for this beginning of time. Uh, but you're also in this space helping SMEs, and I think that's particularly one of the challenges that you face uh, between uh, uh, helping the SMEs adopt technology as well as helping them with the underlying uh, financing. Yeah, Robert, uh, that's actually a valid statement because banks are usually are taking on the uh, higher side of the SME. Uh, there are some points that we are uh, taking action in terms of helping them. Uh, the first thing is actually how the bank can reach out to the debtors, how the bank can reach out to the customers, because we are still utilizing the uh, brand network. And uh, by reaching them out, uh, we can providing them with a, a valid restructuring scheme, because usually uh, the, the higher end of the SME will need the restructuring scheme during the hard times. And uh, one thing that we are providing them is actually instead of giving them the one size fits for all restructuring scheme, we are thinking about the customization of each of the potential customer on how do the restructuring based on their latest condition. And uh, the second point is also we are providing uh, uh, them with the uh, uh, partnership with the FinTech and how to elaborate more on the business. We are not stopping any lending schematics, but we are still opening the lending disbursement and partnering uh, with FinTech uh, in order to helping the SME during the hard times. Thank you, Harianto. Michael, very different in your space because it's no longer about financing or restructuring. It's actually investing, and investing is always about growth. Yeah. So I think maybe t over to you in terms of, of what's happening. Sure. Um, so for us, it's kind of interesting. We have... Uh, both our startups that, that we invest in actually become SMEs at some point in time. Um, so for us, they're, they're an SME market as well. But on the other hand, all of our tech companies, or most of them, are actually serving the SME market as a, as a business. So one of the trends that we've been seeing more and more, and um, yeah, our colleagues from the banks also know this, that startups have decided to provide financing services for their SME partners. So if you look at um, consumer marketplaces, um, if you look at certain SME businesses, you're seeing more and more that they're providing lending services to their, to their um, merchant partners as well. And whether it's by providing a loan book, whether it's by working together with banks or working together with underwriters, uh, it's a big trend we're seeing. So the support for merchants and SME companies across the region um, doesn't only come from banks, but startups are playing a more and more significant role in that, in that part as well. If I look at our perspective as a, as a venture capital firm, for us, it's important to look at you know, high risk, high reward. So we typically wouldn't do that. Uh, for us, investments mean investing in equity and, and looking for that high reward at some point in time. And that's where we try to support our startups as much as, as, much as we can, but even go, go to the fact where we can support their customers when it comes to SMEs and find a way to provide more services for them. I'm going to come back to you on that point about support within the ecosystems because I think when we look at the whole ecosystem for SMEs, it's, it's all parts. It's banks, it's venture capital. Uh, it's interesting that you say that SMEs are actually looking to pr provide support. And I think the question we'll ask later is, are there any players in the ecosystem who aren't pulling their weight at this point in time? Uh, coming back to the point on data, when, when you all of, uh, for data decisions and data-driven uh, uh, functions, uh, technology adoption always comes with data. And I think maybe one of the interesting areas would be to look at how data is used in the different roles that you use to support SMEs and how critical it is to whether you can even perform your functions. Uh, I'm going to pass this back uh, in the order I started with. An Anthony, over to you. Sure. Uh, so I, I think, again, since we deal with MSMEs, it's, it's that transition from individual to micro SMEs, uh, and therefore, even in some of the individual payment patterns, we have enough to enable a credit line. Uh, and we saw this um, even in the Philippines, where uh, in, my, in a former life, uh, where retailers worked with the largest wholesalers and used this, and we stumbled on this, actually, because it was supposed to be an individual credit line. Uh, but we found that it was being used clearly for working capital. Uh, now, the other piece is that, that we have, uh, beyond the data, uh, what we also provide is uh, we have a chat platform uh, within the app in Momo, uh, and we've built an escrow service, uh, and we've partnered with logistics and delivery companies. So, you know, every part of that process uh, is being addressed so that ultimately we collect enough because uh, you know, people don't organically start uh, sell some of it, yes, uh, but I think it's the identification of when uh, an individual 
is transitioning into that small business and then we have to identify them as such and then support them with all the tools that they need and double down into that. Uh, that's how we generate the data that we then feed to uh, you know, other larger fintechs that are specialized in SME uh, uh, financing or, or, or banks for that matter uh, or, or others who, who may be wanting to access this space of, uh, of uh, businesses. So, so Nicholas, again, clearly uh, a role that you, you play in Valdez, which is looking at the data uh, from the supply chains and how that can actually be used. Again, how critical a role is that? Because one of the things that we've heard repeatedly uh, or previously when we've had discussions with the panel is you can't trust your customer, so you need the data to build that trust uh, in the customer in terms of uh, uh, validating what he's actually doing. Yeah, absolutely, Robert. You know, when we started the business, we said, you know, look at the SME financing gap. You know, it's, it's 20 billion in Singapore, it's 100 billion in Indonesia, and you know, the numbers are in that range across ASEAN. Now, why does that gap exist? Because when an SME comes to you with unaudited financial statements that, you know, they could have cooked up in the back room, how do you trust that? Run any algos on it, garbage in is garbage out. And that's where we flip the problem on the head saying, why don't we catch the SME at the point of transaction? finance that transaction, and then let's build a relationship with them. And that's where you know the whole concept of alternate data comes in. When we look at our business, we look at it as you know multifunctional channels, which could be supply chain financing, which could be connecting uh, to other ecosystems, just like what Anthony spoke about at Momo, which could be connecting to uh, you know e-commerce e platforms, supply chain financing platforms, basically anybody who aggregates SMEs and have, has alternate data on them. All of that flows through a credit engine which underwrites it, which is then connected to a pool of capital that I manage. And that is where the power of data comes in. And uh, you know, that's why we're always hungry to see what data can be used for underwriting you know, an SME. It doesn't have to be financial statements. If it's, if it's a small chain of restaurants, can I look at how much raw material they're buying? And you know, what is their payment behavior to their raw material suppliers? If it's a logistics firm, can we look at how much uh, you know, goods they're moving? And again, you know, what, what, is, what is their pattern? So, any information which tells me how an SME's business is doing um, is good enough uh, for me to start underwriting them and to support them in that growth journey. So Haryanto, at your level, the SMEs are probably a bit more sophisticated, they're dealing with a bank, but you go actually to help them in terms of uh, process re-engineering and then taking the data from that process re-engineering to see how their businesses are performing. So that data again is relevant uh, to how you lend and, and how you support these businesses in terms of, of, of their initiatives. Maybe you'd like to just jump onto that. That's correct, Robert. Actually, I am taking in on your last comment about the trust. I think trust uh, needs to be built. And by opening your data uh, to the banks, actually banks can help uh, the customers by providing them with some advice, of course. For example, how the uh, clients can have much better efficiency by looking at the productivity data, by looking at the financial data, because we are still underwriting much of the higher SME client one-on-one. -on -one. And if the, uh, the clients open up their data and the bank has a lot of data, those data aggregations can actually can be translated into the industry trend, which is the bank can use to identify which industry have more resilience or more potentials for more uh, lending disbursement uh, during these hard times, Robert. Michael, again, uh, where you are coming from is slightly different because you're coming from an investor position. Yeah. And, and so whilst the SMEs that you invest in or support will have to provide you data, ultimately uh, the kind of businesses that you have been investing in have visibility of their customer. Yeah. So their customer visibility and the data that they get from their customers must become an important part when you make your decision as to whether this is a company worth investing in. Absolutely. Maybe the role of data in that, in that part. Yeah, for us, for us, data is the most important part of our business. Um, we are unable to make any decision without it. Um, there, there's actually two layers of data for us. On, on the one hand, there is uh, data that is provided by whether it's the SME that we invest in or data provided by uh, data partners. So more and more we're seeing that there's data available that is outside of the company. So as an example, if, if we invest in, a, in an e-commerce company or in a marketplace or in a logistics company, of course, we can look at the, the stats that we're getting from the company itself. But more and more, we have the ability to um, look at other data sources. So for instance, we'll look at their customers and the data that they provide us. Uh, we'll look at their suppliers and the data that they provide us. Uh, we'll look at general public data that, that we can use. Um, so for us, data is the essential part in terms, of, uh, in terms of making decisions. And I think also SMEs should 
generally realize that the moment that you are working with a, um, a Validus or a Momo and you are a, a data provider to them, you know, there are other sources for them as well uh, to look at, you know, are these data points that you're giving us, are they valid? And are, is it something that we can build on as a, as, as a company? So just be very aware of, um, you know, being transparent in your own data is crucial, but also making sure that, you know, people are looking at other data sources as well when it comes to looking at your business. So we're looking at the tools that are necessary to help SMEs, and, and basically uh, from the panel, we, we understand that with those tools in place, you're all, all there, ready and geared to support the SMEs in different parts of the, of the value chain and different parts of their life cycle. But I think the big question is, when it comes to SME technology, adoption is always the challenge. Uh, it's, it's, it's one thing to have the tools, it's another thing to know how to use the tools. So I think one of the challenges that we face, and, and, and it's across the region, I think it's globally, is how do we help SMEs use the tools that we have effectively? How do we help them adopt them and actually therefore generate the data that you're talking about? So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start in a bit of a different order. Harianto, in terms of helping the businesses adopt tools, I know you, you do both digital tools as well as all the way down to process re-engineering and in fact, in fact manufacturing tools. Um, maybe starting with you, how does the bank handhold businesses through this process? Yeah, for, uh, for the lower, side, uh, lower end of the SME, uh, we are partnering with a FinTech provider, which is uh, we provided the uh, lower side of the SME with the tools to uh, do the digital journaling, for example. And uh, the other case, is actually we are providing them also with the digital POS. Uh, both are the partnership that we do. The, uh, uh, the goals is are, of course, to make the adaptation of the technology much, much better for the lower uh, end of the SME. And for the higher end of the SME, we are trying to provide them with the value chain tools whereby we can uh, have a uh, stream of data and confirmation from the, print, the, big, the bigger principle and then uh, the transactions to the middle end of the SME. Uh, that are some cases that we did. Um. Validus, Niklish, you, you are working the supply chain, so you've got big buyers who are keen to roll out the technology, but that's just from the big buyer's perspective. Uh, if you actually look at the other end of the spectrum, you've got to actually translate and help people uh, come onto those platforms in order to get those data. Uh, what, what do you do to handhold SMEs in this space? Thanks, Robert. I think the idea is not to push the SME towards technology, but educate them that using technology will not only help them, of course, improve their, their own business productivity, but maybe get financing at a much better rate. So we tell the SME that, look, you know, if you are just giving me hard copy financial statements, it doesn't work. Everything you have to give to me is digital. You know, I have partners, which could be uh, online accounting software providers like a zero, you know, these would be uh, procurement platforms. If you're giving me a scanned copy of a new contract that you have won, I need to, you know, OCR it, and then there is always a fraud risk. If I get that from, let's say, a financing platform like a, like a Proxterra, you know, which has just been unveiled uh, during the FinTech Festival, then I know that that purchase order contract is true. I can finance it in minutes because there is no fraud risk, and therefore, you know, the lower the risk, the better price I can give to you. So that's a process of educating the SME that look, the more digital you are, the more true the data is that everybody can access about you, and then better the quality of services, whether you know it's from a financing partner or maybe any other partner who helps an SME in that growth. Michael, to you first. Uh, in terms of the companies that you've been investing in, I know many of them have products that go out to the SMEs, uh, um, and really, the differentiating factor on how readily or how easily those products can be adopted must be a factor for you in, term, in terms of deciding whether to invest in those companies. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, we definitely look at the, uh, at the onboarding process. And you know, to, to the, the earlier panel's point, you can't just dump a bunch of technology on, on an SME and say, well, use it and, and you'll be fine. Um, so the education process is one of the most important parts of it. So what we tend to do is when we look at companies and we look at how they are interacting with, with their clients and their SMEs is, is your product right to fit? And is your customer, your client at a, at a level that they are able to use your technology? Um, so to give an example, we have a company in Indonesia which does online invoicing for, uh, for micro businesses across, across the country. The difficulty for them is that their customer base is coming from pen and paper and they're now for the first time using technology to run their invoicing. This is a big difference. So it doesn't make any sense to have like a huge CRM application and say, well, use it as, as of tomorrow. So you start simple. You start with a very small, lightweight invoicing, invoicing business. 
that allows them to onboard their paper invoices into an online system. Then you slowly go to invoice tracking, and then you slowly go to invoice payments. So you kind of take the SME on a journey and help them um, sort of create the technology stack within, within their own business. But that, ju that journey is, is relatively uh, paced, and education is a big part of it. Anthony, you've had experience in more than one country in trying to get even foundational technology adopted by SMEs. You've had successes, you've had failures, you've had challenges in, in these. Um, over to you. Yeah, uh, sure. And then I'm going to pick up on what Michael said in terms of uh, the onboarding process and the journey. Uh, because it's important that, I mean, just like everything we do in technology, right, the, the easier you make it and the lower the cost of entry, uh, you know, adoption sort of comes with it, right? Uh, so we start with the, the most basic. It's not the you know it's not the fanciest, but uh, you know even an offline QR code with a sticker, right? Where you don't need to invest in a device, right? Or a 15-minute onboarding, remotely enabled for uh, you know online payment acceptance. Then we watch organic moves. So if we see on our P2P platform, if we see greater than say 25 Receive, receive payments, right? Uh, that gives us an indication that this is probably a business, right? Uh, and that's where we start doubling down. So we look at people who are anyway using the platform in some way which uh, seems you know, akin to uh, a business. Then we start looking at targeting those individuals and onboarding them as merchants. Then we start looking at marketing tools for them. As I said, you know, selling ads on Facebook is one, but actually using our platform with digital vouchers or uh, or even our mini app. But that's a little more sophisticated because you know you need a little more uh, tech uh, ability there. But it's really part of that journey. And then uh, again, I mentioned earlier the you know the escrow service because to Haryanto's point on trust. Uh, for selling online, you do need to, and, and that's the origin of, uh, of, I guess, Alipay and Alibaba. Uh, but it's still not solved for, uh, you know, the countries that uh, that I work in currently, or, or even some of the prior countries. And so we've been trying to journey from individual to micro SME, identify trends, and then build on, you know, tools targeting. Uh, those participants in our ecosystem that we believe are graduating to uh, more sophisticated forms of, um, of technology for their businesses. So in terms of helping businesses recover, it's clearly quite clear from the conversation today that it's about injecting your services into that business and really being a partner in that business in terms of the recovery. I wanted to use the chance now to basically uh, touch the panel on, on examples of where you've had success or any particular examples you'd like to bring forward about companies that have been able to navigate this difficult time. Um, I'll just pass, pass this first to Haryanto. Okay, Robert. Uh, if we are looking on the... Uh, I'll, I'll just... Uh, I'll just to use the public data about the restructuring itself. It's not, I think it's not about one or two cases for the banks. Because if you look at the, how the uh, Indonesian economy right now, uh, based on the data, we have uh, approximately like 63 billion US dollars uh, in the market that needs to be restructuring. Uh, considering that number is huge, I think uh, in terms of the real cases is uh, actually by the end of the day, how we can navigate together with the customers on uh, how we can uh, pass this pandemic era and then how we can do it together to survive and turn back the business. I think uh, uh, if we can do it with this kind of the scale that we are uh, undergo right now, that will be a proven uh, the biggest test case that we are having right now. Anthony, you talked about lychees. Um, yeah. Uh, I think for those people who are, know, who are familiar with the BSB Proctera uh, initiative, right. it's always been about mangoes. But, but on lychees <laughs> and other small businesses, uh, maybe give us a couple of examples of, of how businesses have been navigating and succeeding. Yeah, I, I think I'll start with the fact that, uh, you know, Vietnam as a country has probably dealt with this pandemic the best. Uh, and therefore, you know, the real... Uh, it, it, you know, pain wasn't felt as much, at least on the on the level of the health crisis, right? So people still, I mean, yes, for a couple of weeks uh, there was a lockdown, but uh, not you know not severe, and and people are are leading as normal a life now. 
no country is immune from economic impact because, again, you know, countries are also dependent on each other, and therefore there were parts of the economy for sure that uh, were impacted. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I think the Lychee example was one where, uh, which was early into the pandemic, where there was, there was this uh, real initiative uh, to support Vietnamese farm products. Right. Uh, and, and we've seen this, right, where uh, sellers were, were, were very dependent on international markets. I think we needed to make it uh, more uh, sort of attractive for them to appeal to the domestic market, right? And, and that's where uh, we have a perfect platform. We have, you know, millions of Vietnamese consumers who are, uh, who are coming on, uh, you know, the platform uh, at, at high frequency. And that's where we we started working with Coop because again it's difficult to address them you know one at a time when they're very small. So we worked with a cooperative uh, that you know that already organizes a lot of these uh, informal sellers, and that's how we were able to uh, and and we did it with the help of you know a local newspaper and uh, and and that's how you know a few of us got together to deliver this um, you know uh, uh, on the platform. The other. Uh, way that I have seen that the platform has been useful is through direct disbursement. Uh, because sometimes with these relief efforts, uh, you know, they're, they're in, and it's quite common for, for layers to have, uh, you know, to take away some of the benefit that should ultimately go to, uh, you know, the small business. Uh, uh, while we have a direct disbursement platform and that makes it, uh, you know, very efficient and productive, uh, you know, both from a transparency standpoint and just getting it directly to uh, the beneficiary. So maybe those are uh, ways in which we could help. Uh, Nicholas, um, obviously the, the platform uh, play is one of those areas where, you know, Proxterra is trying to be there. But before I go there, I just wanted to say, Anthony, we're really, uh, with the challenges that everybody has faced with COVID, I think nobody begrudges anybody who has been able to, to, to survive this well. And, and, and kudos to Vietnam. Uh, and, I'm, and we're really happy uh, that the impact was was not as felt as badly there. But but over over to you, Nicholas. In terms of connecting these these platforms together, uh, uh, whether it's to trade locally or whether it's to trade internationally, I think this is one of the one of those areas where Valdis is is also part of the Proxterra initiative because the recognition that uh, in order for SMEs to really flourish, you need to have a multimodal and multi connector uh, across this area. Maybe 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 to you on this point. Yeah, absolutely, Robert. So when we when we started, we mainly focused on domestic trade which is local SMEs supplying to local corporates because it was a closed loop ecosystem within a country and therefore a lot easy to finance. But cross-border trade is something that we've always had an eye on. But then there were always questions around, look, if things go wrong, how do I trust the buyer? How do I trust the supplier? Who kind of steps in and solves all these problems for me? Uh, you know, I mean, we are, we are a technology company. What we want is data to come to us, quickly underwrite it and, you know, start helping these SMEs. And that's when a platform like Proxterra comes in which is backed by the central bank you know, in a country, therefore has a lot more coordination with other countries where buyers and suppliers are there. It's almost like a dream come true. So uh, you know, when we got a chance to step in as financer, we, we grabbed the opportunity with both hands. And uh, you know, earlier this week, we showcased uh, financing a live transaction where there was an SME from Singapore uh, you know, supplying uh, goods and services overseas. They won a small contract. Uh, you know, digitally, the contract came to us. Uh, we underwrote, financed, the SME got, uh, you know, money the same day. And that is what you want as an SME, and that is what you want you to, you know, to do as a platform, which is you want a contract. You don't want to go around then trying to find out, can I finance it? Can I service it? Because somebody else will take the contract. You know, our job is to make the SMEs more competitive, to help them grow, to really, you know, realize their dreams. And, and we love uh, such platforms and ideas. So injecting yourself into the businesses is one way to help them recover. Connecting the businesses together is another way to help the businesses recover. But I think the next question I would like to ask and put this, put this to Michael, uh, because you see it from the top of the pyramid is, will the recovery be even? I mean, we were sitting here in a conversation just now uh, before this panel looking at technology spaces where valuations were phenomenal. And here we are talking about SMEs who can't get enough money to keep the, the lights on. Yeah. So will the recovery be even? And, and what do you see about that landscape? Um, so, one, the recovery won't be even, um, and, and even more so, it will be very hard, and, and it will take some time. It's, it's, it's very interesting to see the difference between the, the tech and the non-tech businesses, and I just want to give one, one quick example. Um, the moment countries went into lockdown, everyone assumed that 
the stuff that they can get from their retailer that they go through on a Saturday, they can still get it online. But if you look at it from the retailer perspective, um, within a few weeks, they had to shut down their business, um, think about their revenue, think about their staff, think about their brand, think about their product, and in the meantime, also go online. And then when they go online, they have to think about payments, logistics, inventory management, branding, who's actually going to build this website. So there were like a lot of issues in, in terms of switching um, non-tech SMEs to, uh, to a tech platform. Now that for a lot of businesses has happened, uh, what does it mean for their future? Um, so what does it, does it mean when economies open up again? Um, so they now have a dual strategy, um, having your, your physical store and having your online store. But for instance, if you look at travel, a lot of travel businesses, they, they had to pivot also really fast. Uh, for instance, from um, international travel to domestic travel or from international travel to local experiences. So all of these businesses had to pivot. Now, when economies open up again, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be back online from day one. Uh, for anyone that's traveling quite often, um, you're going to rethink going to another country uh, for the next few months or even for the next year. Um, you're going to rethink going to maybe a, even a big conference uh, for, for the next year. So hybrid conferences will, will be a thing for, for a while. So in that sense, different industries will have a different pace in terms of, in terms of coming back online. Um, I do feel that technology as an enabler has shown the world that a lot of, a lot of it a lot is possible. Uh, so when it comes to uh, supply chain financing, when it comes to logistics, when it comes to e-commerce, when it comes to travel, there's a lot possible that we can do with technology, and it's clear that, that it's here to stay. I think what is important now is that all of these SMEs that have had to switch over the last few months in terms of being purely physical to being a hybrid or being online, that they need as much support as they can get to keep the business running over the next few years. Um, in terms of recovery, there will be those, and I think, Michael, you touched on it briefly, those who just won't be able to recover. The sector has changed, there's been a fundamental disruption. Um, what's the role in that space? And, and maybe, Harianto, because you, know, you talked about restructuring large amounts of debt in Indonesia, there will be some companies where even restructuring is no longer an option. How can, how can banks and investors help in that situation, or is it merely just laying out the cards as they are to the company to allow them to, to, to recognize the challenges that they're in? Okay, Robert. Uh, I'm starting with the good news first. Actually, we are, uh, from bank's perspective, we are now uh, seeing a little bit uh, light by in the end of the tunnel. Actually, we are starting uh, to see that uh, some of the uh, uh, potential customers are uh, successfully getting through this, but of course you're right, not all of them, but uh, we are also preparing that some part of the customer or the, some part of the portfolio uh, will not survive during this pandemic area. Uh, to answer your questions, actually there are a lot uh, that the finance institution can do. Let me give you the example that uh, for the higher end of the XME, uh, for the example is uh, how can banks can help them to find the new investors and uh, how the new investor can help them to survive the business. That's just uh, uh, one example case on how the, the financial institution can help uh, the existing customers. So we, we've got different players in different spaces here, and I know, Harianto, that the, the bank works with fintech companies, but one of the things that really needs to be done is for all of the technology players to really interact with each other and work together to deliver the value uh, uh, to yeah. SMEs and help them uh, collectively. I think we, we used the term previously about recycling lost opportunities, whether it's a lost opportunity in financing into, into investment or a lost opportunity uh, in terms of providing debt because you're the wrong institution to provide that debt. That requires you to share data across organizations and across different functions. What would you like to see for 2021? If you took the lens forward to next year, what would you like to see as a concrete step that an SME could take uh, in 2021, which maybe they haven't taken in 2020, or a step they've taken in 2020, and what's the next step after that? Anthony, what would you like to see for 2021 from SMEs? Um, I'd, I'd like to see them start to accept payments um, uh, electronically, uh, and, and uh, I'd, I'd like to see them use some of our tools to help drive consumers or, or, or businesses whom they sell to to, uh, to the platform. Uh, I'd like to see that we get them to a place where uh, we can provide uh, some indication to financiers, because we really see ourselves more as a platform uh, to financiers or investors uh, so that they become attractive uh, uh, for, for these financiers or investors to do business with. 
Niklas, over to you. The closing thoughts on 2021. What would you like to see concrete steps that a SME could take? Sure. Uh, Robert, I would like to see the SMEs become a lot more demanding. You know, if you look at consumers and large corporates, you know, they are very demanding. They know exactly what they want. SMEs are standing right at the end of the queue. So, you know, if I'm an SME and I don't want to stand at the end of the queue, I want to demand, uh, you know, from the bank saying that, look, if you are not going to service me, you have my data for the last 10 years. Can you package it, give it to somebody else who can maybe service me? I want the SME to maybe go to the governments and saying, you have so much data on me, you know, on the taxes I'm paying, on the levies, on my track record. Can you put it in a central database that a startup can access and maybe service me? So I just want the SMA to stand up and saying, hey, guys, do something for me. Very nice. Harianto. From my side, I would like to see the continuation of the technology adaptation because I think that will bring us together into the new era. And of course, I would like to see the level of partnership between banks and the fintechs is also increasing and how we can do the data integration, we can do the recycling of the potential lots much, much better than we are right now. Michael, you're in the studio with me. You can see the clocks running down. Yes. Your 2021. Um, I'm really hoping that the, the ones that are providing finance and whether it's a VC, a bank, um, a startup, um, it doesn't matter, but I think anyone that, that is providing financing to SMEs, I really hope that people will get also their kind of their hands dirty, help the entrepreneurs, uh, just make sure that they're not alone, uh, but they're you know we're there for them to uh, to help them. So at the start of the uh, start of the conversation, we talked about whether or not banks and investors were doing enough. Clearly, you are all doing a lot, but I think the challenges that SMEs face require us to continue with those efforts because more needs to be done. So again, I'd like to thank the panel and thank Singapore FinTech Festival for having us this morning. And I turn it back. New normal brings about new problems, both for you and your customers. As the CEO of a B2B platform, you know this better than anyone. But the new normal has also brought you a new solution, a solution that will help you create value and solve the challenges your customers are currently facing. Introducing Proxdera, an open global network that connects your platform to other platforms and trade services, bringing your customers a new world of possibilities. This is what Proxdera can do for you. Let's take a closer look at Neha, one of your customers. Neha, like many others, owns a local business, a sundry store that sells daily necessities. With COVID-19, it's been difficult for her to get milk powder and other new products from her existing suppliers. Neha feels like she has no other option. Now let's reimagine Neha's story with Proxtera, the power of a global reach. By connecting your platform to Proxtera, you can give Neha options. Now, as Neha searches for milk powder, she is presented with a world of opportunities. Opportunities you have brought to her through the Proxtera network. All filtered to what she wants, all relevant to what she needs. Neha's options have just been expanded with new suppliers on other platforms, both locally and globally. She is now able to find the right product for her customers, and more importantly, at the right price, through you. By connecting your platform, Proxera enables Neha to connect with other platforms beyond yours. It also doesn't stop there. Proxera also helps overcome financing, logistics, and payment challenges faced by your customers. So connect to Proxera today, and you will find that there is nowhere in the world that's out of reach. Proxera, bringing the world to you. Thank you, Robert and panel, for that engaging discussion on the growth challenges for SMEs. Come and experience the Singapore FinTech Festival running on Microsoft Teams. Join us at Microsoft Digital Booth, where our customers and partners will be sharing how technology and innovation have become a must-have than a nice-to-have in the pandemic. Well, this marks the end of the Investor Summit of the Singapore FinTech Festival 2020 right here on the Global Common Channel. I'm Glenn Van Zupp, and it's been a pleasure to spend some time with you today. Now, of course, if you've missed any of our sessions, including our highlight session discussing investing amid uncertainty, be sure to access the recording of those sessions on the event website. And of course, everything's going to be available on, on the website and YouTube starting on Saturday the 12th. 
Meanwhile, I'll say goodbye until tomorrow and hand over to my co-host Sharon Tong. Hi, Sharon, hi Glenn. Great to see you. Great to see you. The, are gonna it's the last day. I know. You are going to start the Talent Summit. Talent Summit. I think Summit we are me. all excited about it. As that. you know, the Singapore FinTech Festival mm. it, this year, it's a very people-focused theme. So I think it, you know, today's uh, really about the people. It's really about the talent behind mm. the FinTech startups. So I'm really excited because, you know, we'll be speaking to many founders. We're going to get their stories. Uh, I, for one, I'm going to be speaking with Jason Gardner, mm. uh, the founder of Marketa. Okay. So that will be coming up, you know, later in the day. But uh, I'm really excited. Our highlight session this uh, for today is going to be the CEO of uh, Xiaomi. Oh. I really want to listen to that one that as well. That should be exciting. The way they've taken over in Asia has just been amazing Absolutely, and across the world. Yes. You know, uh, during our day today, uh, one of our highlight sessions when we were talking about, you know, ESG environment, uh, social and corporate governance, was the session between Michael Milken and Thomas Curran, who's the head of global uh, of cloud yeah, for Google, one, right? Yeah. And it was just so interesting to hear these guys talk about where we're at now with doing everything in the cloud, and of course hearing Thomas talk about where we're going in the future. Uh, so, to, and 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 where sustainability plays a part in all of that as well. Uh, so some very interesting sessions today. I know you had some earlier in the day as well uh, when we were looking at our investing session yeah. uh, and talking about uh, uh, just all aspects of what it means to be um, a responsible corporation mm -hmm. in the 21st century. Yeah, definitely the sessions uh, during my segment, the Asia Pacific segment was actually very forward looking. You know, yeah. They were always looking ahead, always looking about, uh, and there was a lot of hope in there, mm. uh, always looking ahead at uh, what uh, people would be looking to invest in, uh, what the outlook was like in, you know, uh, in the next five, 10 years even. So mm. it was very forward looking and very actually pretty hopeful, you know, despite the fact that they're right, right in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah, it was interesting too to see our pitch fest that was on, oh, yeah. we had three uh, sessions yeah. of that. Uh, yeah, and, uh, four, four startups. Uh, yes, yeah, but yeah. we had three different yeah, three, sessions okay. going on. And uh, just to see some of the great ideas yeah. and what a great global platform for those startups to yeah. to be on this yeah. week. And I was just uh, talking to Manisha at the mm. end of yesterday, talking about how important it is uh, to be able to communicate right. uh, their product because sure. it was not enough that they really knew their product. They need to be able to sell. They need to be able to explain exactly how it benefits people. Yeah. And I think uh, to some extent, uh, for my fireside chat with Jason Gardner mm. from Marketa, that's exactly where he stands as well. For him, it's always about 90% communication. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just getting out there and being able to present that idea in a way that's, that's clear and concise, that has credibility as well. And, and so many startups are doing that well now. And just a few years ago, that wasn't the case. You know, st uh, startups had a real hard time in pitch fests, mm -hmm. no matter where they were, let alone a global stage like the one we have here uh, yeah. today and this week. Uh, so it's great to see that, that many of these startups are now really um, stepping up to the plate, you know, yeah, raising absolutely. the bar in their own and communication. And you know, the investors are looking at the founders. They're looking at what kind of founder, who's the team behind uh, the man who, who, you know, who is uh, selling that product. Yeah. They're not just, not just looking at the idea, they're looking at the person behind it. So it's even more important now. Hey, you, you just you, you just used the word man, and I know you didn't mean <laughs> only men, right? But that I'm brought so up. I'm glad I'm female, so <laughs> I'm, I'm allowed. Glad you I'm said allowed. It. <laughs> <laughs> but I just wanted to mention one thing, and that was, you know, during the course of these four days so far, it has just been fantastic to see the number of either all female yes. panels yeah, yeah, or predominantly female yeah, panels, I agree. And, and not just the not just to have that diversity, but to hear the ideas mm -hmm. that are coming out of these companies, these high-level CEOs. Yeah. Um, who are female, uh, but just there, there's a there's a new it's a new day in terms no, of looking I, at I companies. I hope you know in the future all the fintech festivals you'll see the percentages of uh, female CEOs actually increase. I really do. That's one thing I really hope to see in in the Ho future. Hopefully. The day of the mantle is gone, right? Man, men yeah. panels. We should change the English language a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm going to let you get started because I think you've got a great day lined yes, up. I'm looking so forward to it. Good to see you again. Right. Have fun, and I'll, I'll be back in uh, about 20 hours or 18 hours or so <laughs> uh, to finish out the day yeah, tomorrow. So great. Enjoy. Have fun. Have fun with your rest. Thank you.
Welcome to the Talent Summit of Singapore FinTech Festival 2020. I'm Sharon Tong. Thank you for being part of the festival. We know there's a lot to digest from hundreds of sessions with 800 plus speakers. In case you missed any of them, you will be able to access all session recordings organized nicely into 14 themes anytime on YouTube from 12th December. That's tomorrow. No login required. And for all our paying delegates, we have something special for you. You will receive a specially curated four-part SFF 2020 Insights Report covering all sessions featuring 800 plus speakers as well as partners content. Do also look out for your SFF 2021 discount voucher exclusively for you. Now, today's focus addresses topics on building skills for the future. We are currently in the Asia Pacific zone of the day. So don't forget to also follow our Green Shoots channel, Hyper Local channel and Global Satellite event partner sessions for more content throughout the day. Now, the highlight session in today's Asia Pacific Zone is the Founder Stories session with Hong Feng, Chief Executive Officer of Xiaomi. Now, if you're just joining us today, this year's Singapore FinTech Festival is all global and distributed. We are live online 24 hours a day with content from more than 40 fintech hubs around the world. You are now following the Global Common Channel featuring high-level thought leaders and global policy makers. You can also choose to watch content on the Green Shoots channel with new concepts and deep dive discussions or you can browse content in the hyper-local channels which are curated by partners in the fintech hubs. Now, yesterday, the Monetary Authority of Singapore announced some exciting news. The MAS has announced the winners of the MAS Global Fintech Innovation Challenge, which seeks to identify and recognize groundbreaking solutions that can en enable the financial sector to respond to two pressing global challenges of today, COVID-19 and climate change. In the SG Founder category, we have Hashtags in third place, followed by FinChat in second place, and Triterras in first place. Next, in the ASEAN FinTech category, coming in as second runner-up is FlexM, followed by NextBank as first runner-up, and finally, Awantunai in first place. On to the SG Financial Institution category, we have in third place, DBS, OCBC in second, Validus Capital in first place. In the global category, we have BNY Mellon coming in as second runner-up, Azen coming in as first runner-up, and coming in in the first place, Swiss Re. In this next segment, we have the awardees for the Global Fintech Accelerator in no order of merit. Intencell Limited, Mata, and Regulation Limited. Congratulations to the 12 winners of the Fintech Awards and three winners of the Global Fintech Accelerator who walked away with a total cash prize of $1.75 million. And that wraps up this year's MAS Fintech Awards and Global Fintech Accelerator. And we look forward to seeing everyone next year. Now, to help you navigate the online city, here are some highlight sessions taking place this morning. JP Morgan is hosting a workshop on blockchain starting right now. Standard Chartered will be hosting a presentation at 10 a.m. And Microsoft also hosting a presentation at 10 a.m. on DevOps. And MasterCard running a university workshop at 11 a.m.